Glad you're here at Science Sunday, August 2nd. And uh, Scott Thompson is in here with Dave, and we're uh, ready to start talking about some bats. I thought this would be a fun topic, and it, as the more I looked into it, the more I saw how it uh, competed or, or discussed things that we've talked about earlier. It has things to do with viral load, uh, natural reservoirs of disease, things we talked about earlier. So you may note some things that we talk about have some applications to uh, past Science Sundays. So when you uh, see something like that, that uh, it's a pretty interesting phenomenon. I wanted to uh, thank this. I don't know how close Steve can get to this picture, or this uh, tie was given to me. Uh, it's a tie that was given to me by uh, Ben Ariano, Ann Ariano's son. He went, uh, at the age of 13, he went to Washington, D.C. and uh, but figuring that the thing you do when you go to Washington, D.C. is you get an emphasis and an interest in science, and I like that. Most people go there, and I'm not sure that science is the first thing, although it's a great place for science. But uh, uh, in the course of a move, Anne came across this, and she and Ben decided that uh, Science Sunday should have this. So maybe uh, when Scott starts doing some pretty interesting science stuff, I'll have him put this tie on. So. He's got his thumbs up, he's ready to wear it. So, again, welcome to Science Sunday. We're glad you're here. Uh, hope you're having a great day. We're getting through this uh, pandemic time together and uh, we've had a fun summer doing things about it and I thought uh, bats would be an interesting topic to talk about. Um, they kind of go through, they've been gotten a bad rap, as you probably know, all their, all their years of their existence, but uh, uh, there's some things we ought to know about bats and talk about and see. Uh, it's actually not until fairly recently that their home whole prime method of echolocation and getting around in, uh, in space was even uh, solved, how it was done. There were some pretty gruesome experiments back in oh, the 1700s uh, in which they were trying to find out how bats can get around in the darkness and uh, they uh, reduced their different senses one by one by one and uh, never could figure it out and gave up and finally it was done in 1937 um, by a couple of people that we'll talk about maybe a little bit later as well too. But it's not that long ago that no one knew exactly how bats did it. It seemed surreal, it seemed maybe work of the devil or something like that too. So it's some of the reasons that they've gotten some of their, some of their bad rap. Uh, if you've been able to see over my shoulder, the picture of this uh, uh, bat capturing, uh, going after a moth. That was kind of a pretty uh, amazing picture, I thought. So I wanted to start that out on the front page of the discussion today. Uh, special features of bats that you probably know some things about, but wanted to talk about a little bit more. Uh, kind of baseline of what we know about them. First of all, there were the order of Chiroptera which is the Greek for hand wing. Um, obviously, we've talked in evolutionary detail about how different mammals and different uh, species, all species, uh, plant and animal, develop their capacities um, and uh, develop their structures. And bats actually have grown these membranes that are very uh, much more advanced than I realized until I started looking in, into it. But uh, their whole wings structure is basically membranes between the fingers of their hand and elongated fingers with, uh, with membrane between them that allow them to fly. And fly actually more precisely, more uh, uh, responsibly, uh, more in tune with their brain than uh, birds can fly. Birds fly almost always in complete synchronicity, both wings flapping up and down at the same time. But uh, bats have so much more capability in what they can do that uh, they can turn on a dime, they can do amazing things in their flight. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos you can pull up about bat flight in which you can see some of the amazing structures, amazing ways in which they do this. So, Choroptera is from the Greek that means hand wing. Another thing that was of interest to me, that a quarter of all mammal species are actually bats. Bats have a wide, wide variety, a wide uh, 
spread. They were on all the continents except Antarctica uh, and up in the far north in the Arctic, but an amazing, amazing capacity to um, uh, adapt to whatever environment they're in, to the potential for food and, and life that they're in, and everything that's there. So a quarter of all mammal species are bats. They're only uh, surpassed by uh, rodents as uh, many, many more different kind of species of rodents, but uh, they're the second largest in actual numbers of, of species. Uh, Scott, are we going to be able to take some questions when people want to call up and set in? you setting that up? Yeah, on a Zoom meeting we should be able to take questions. Okay, so we're on a Zoom meeting and people can get into that on the Humanist website if they want and there's questions available there. Um, and you're going to monitor that as we talk. So please, if you have questions or thoughts or responses, please uh, uh, send those in. I know I got a really interesting email from uh, Elliot the other uh, few days ago when I announced that this was bats, and he sent me some really interesting stuff to look into. So I had to remodify a lot of my talk to incorporate some of the really fascinating stuff he was looking at. Dave wants to open. Could you ask people on, or I can, uh, people on Zoom, I'm, can you mute? And then if you have a question, type your question into the chat box. Yeah, uh, Scott's saying, I think we probably can't hear you well, but there's a microphone up here for you when you want one, Scott. Thank you. But uh, he's asking you to mute. If you're on the Zoom uh, meetup, mute on the Zoom and type in your questions, and that'll allow us to, uh, to keep the, uh, the, the, the Science Sunday talk going on without interruptions. So uh, type them in. So a quarter of all mammal species are bats, all varieties, and, and uh, we'll talk more about the whole great dispersal of bats over, over the planet. And uh, uh, they're the only truly flying mammals. There's mammals that soar or glide or things like that, uh, flying squirrels and things that can uh, glide from a tree to another tree or a tree to the ground or something like that, you know, uh, overcoming some level of gravity. But mammal, as a flying mammal, bats are the, are the ones that, uh, are the only ones that there are. Over 1,300 different species of bats. Uh, I'll show you some pictures. The smallest is uh, about the size, it's called a bumblebee bat. It's about the size of your thumbnail, uh, although its wings, when they stretch out, can be as much as five inches long. But uh, up to flying foxes and some of the animals that have very seeming like very uh, canine faces to them. Um, and those are mainly fruit eaters and uh, live in Indonesia and the Southeast Asia area. And those can have wingspans of over five feet long, similar to a hawk or an eagle. So five inch to five foot wingspans. And, uh, the smallest weight is equal. The smallest bat, bumblebee bat, is about the weight of two dimes, and it keeps its whole structure in there, and we'll talk more about the structure of bats in, in a bit as well, too. All the things that do that enable it to fly and eat and breed and, and all these things are all supported by an animal structure that's only the weight of two dimes. These are a couple of pictures of the bumblebee bat on the left, and the uh, flying fox with actually a young uh, a pup in its grasp uh, on the right. So the pictures obviously aren't uh, relative in size to each other. That bumblebee bat on the left, about the size of your thumbnail, uh, and the flying fox on the right can be a oh, uh, uh, wingspan of up to five feet. You can see the very canine features of the, of the flying fox. So the history of the bats. This is a picture of a fossil that was found. Uh, many were found in Wyoming. And uh, this is a fossil of the Anicolesis, Anicolesis uh, which has very many bat-like characteristics on it. Uh, you can see the wing structure, very similar to the wings that would be nowadays. The legs are a little bit longer than what you'd normally see, and the tail is a little bit longer than you might generally see on bats today. 
So it's an early developmental uh, fossil, the earliest fossil at all of, of all of bats. 55 million years ago, which is about the time the dinosaurs had, uh, uh, had left, had been uh, taken off the planet by the falling of the uh, meteor. And uh, so this is a fossil from that time, and it's obviously pretty well developed. And going back in ways we've talked about the biological clock of uh, uh, looking back at, at uh, genomes and DNA sequences and so on, uh, the gene structures of, human, of, of animals. And uh, the biological clock says that these things started, were definitely around 66 million years ago, which is the time that the uh, uh, meteor fell in uh, the Yucatan and, and got rid of all the dinosaurs. So this was very quickly after the death and destruction of the dinosaurs that bats came around as one of the primary mammals, uh, finding a niche, finding an open spot in, in history and in a way of looking at the world and a way of fitting into the new world with what all opportunities and options there were. Uh, bats came along and, and uh, filled a niche in a big way. If you look back again with uh, genomes and biological clocks related to most closely, people thought for a while, I think uh, Carl Linnaeus, the man that was famous for putting uh, uh, structures into, uh, putting animals and, and uh, species into structures that, that showed what they were most similar to, uh, he had them actually as a somewhat of a primate. And uh, that has been since debunked, but they are most related closely, and, and probably if I'd asked you, and if you'd be here to respond to me, you might say, eh, they're kind of like flying mice, right? They're like rodents. Or they've got capacities similar to all those creatures. And actually, they are nowhere, uh, they're, well, they're not very closely related to rodents and mice and so on. They're most closely related in existing mammals today to the ungulates, which uh, include camels, include horses, include goats, and include whales. So that still is something that they're working through exactly how they broke away from that and what happened. Who, but obviously a lot of evolution came from a common ancestor that uh, most closely related, not mice and rodents and so on, but, but another small creature that then branched out to become things like horses and whales and and camels and so on. Uh, so that, that was pretty fascinating, fascinating to me to see. Uh, the amount of change that occurred while each creature fit into the niche that it was uh, able to survive in. This is an artist's rendition of the Anacholesis and uh, the things that you see about it, it looks very much like what most lay people would think bats look like nowadays, and there's only a few structures that are slightly different, somewhat different than what you might see in bats nowadays. Uh, one is that there's a claw on every digit. So you can see the wing structure there. Uh, it comes out a little bit lighter than I'm seeing it, uh, but you can see the bone structure, the fingers that lead to, and each at the end of each of those fingers, there's a, there's a claw. And that is very uncommon. Generally, there's one claw on the thumb for, uh, for uh, bats nowadays, which is kind of on the leading edge of the wing, if you see. And uh, none on the rest of them. Some have a second one on maybe the second digit or the third digit. So it's a sign of some slight level of evolution in that time, in the last 52 million years. But very much uh, developed in their capacity to be bat-like in their, in their life structure. I want to talk a bit about flight. This is a picture of a whole cascade of bats coming out from a cave in Texas. It's a pretty famous cave. Uh, and and um, bats come out from there every night and go, go uh, for their nocturnal flights. Um, interesting thing about flight in bats is that it's very adapted to the actual means by which bats eat, where they live, what they're trying to do. 
they have evolved so highly to do the different things that their different capacities that really uh, they need to be able to fly in specific ways to do what they're uh, evolved to do. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, one type of flight is called hawking. And hawking is what you think about, about, about uh, when bats are flying and chasing moths or different insects, mosquitoes in the air or, or caddis uh, larvae and different things like that, mayflies. They have to be amazingly quick and versatile, um, high levels of maneuverability, uh, and, and great speed, uh, doing all this along as they're chasing a bat and, and uh, locating it in the air and 3D space and then coming in and, uh, and actually capturing it. They don't always capture them. Different, different bats capture them in different ways. You kind of think they've got to just snap it up in their mouth. There it is. They just go along and snap it. And some do, but often they make almost like a, a shroud of their, certain bats make a, a shroud almost of their wings and their tails and their membranes and actually almost like a scoop, like a third baseman or something like that. They scoop up the, the, the insect in their in their body parts, in their wings, and then bring it in. And they're so adaptable and so versatile in their flight, they can actually scoop it up towards their mouth as they're flying. They get in-flight meals. In-flight meals. <laughs> Scott says in-flight meals. You should maybe take the microphone just in case you have more <laughs> clever repartee that you're going to uh, give to us here that uh, you, we can all hear you and I don't have to repeat it. So feel free to come on up and get the microphone. All right. All right. Okay. So that's hawking. Uh, fast, fast speeds. In fact, the Mexican free-tailed bat can fly at speeds of the fastest animal of all. And on Earth, horizontal flight speeds, they achieve over 100 miles an hour. It's pretty amazing. No sonic boom, though. <laughs> there might be. Yeah. It's an it's a ultrasonic boom. Yeah. I think they're making continually repeated ultrasonic booms. So, um, that's, that's the hawking technique. Um, gleaning is another one. If, if uh, there's bats that don't chase animals like that, that don't chase insects, but they glean them, they look for them, they find them uh, in the dark, resting or, or sitting on a, on a stick or on a leaf or someplace, on a, on a branch or whatever. And with their echolocation that we're going to talk about in a minute, they have the capacity to particulate exactly where that thing is. And so they have to be able to come in kind of stealthily and hover uh, and listen, actually, for the noises, the, the background noise that the, that the bug is making, and also listen to their ultrasonic call-outs and so on. Like when the bug screams, saying, oh, bats! Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're sending out the special distress signals. Right. And that's their, that's their downfall right there. <clears throat> right. So th those, are, those have to be able to hover and, and stay in the air and, and move uh, quickly to a new spot and make their way through a lot of different foliage and things like that too without uh, damaging themselves or their wing structure. So, they're, so those are very maneuverable bats in a whole different way, but not so intent on speed. So they have a whole different structure to their wings. If you start looking, people that study bats see the whole structure. Some are built for speed, some are built for maneuverability, and so on. So that's gleaning. You talk about hawking and gleaning. Another one is trawling, uh, like a trawler, a boat. And these, there's bats that actually get insects that are on the surface of water. And they just have to be very steady and come along and be very in control so that they don't actually nose dive into the water, but they're coming along at a speed that doesn't have to be great, but it has to be consistent and predictable, and they come in and they pick out the insects off the top of the water. There's, there's also some bats that actually eat fish. We'll talk about the vertebrates that they eat too, but, uh, and those basically do the same thing. They look and they detect a slight ripple on the water of the, of the fish coming up near the surface, and they're able to perceive what that with their sonar, with their echolocation, where that fish is and what's going on, and be able to come in and swoop down and grab a fish out of the water. So that's trawling. 
picking up prey up over the water. Slow speed, but great control. Um, then we're getting to the fruit eaters, the bats that eat fruit. Uh, many of the larger bats uh, in, in the Southeast Asia are, are fruit eaters. And uh, they go and they have to be able to just basically get to a tree and get to the fruit, pick up the fruit, and then they tend to not eat it much at the site. They tend to bring it back to their nest or their, uh, their place. So they're a, a stable flight, able to carry some weight and travel around with something too. Yeah. So they're like the trucking, the truckers of the bat. That makes me think of a question. Yes. Are there any bats that are pollinators? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. We'll be talking about that too. That, in fact, next I was talking about nectar. Um, and those are bats that, that actually, they're generally very much adapted for long um, noses. There's a bat that has a tongue that's so long to get into certain flowers that its tongue coils up inside its abdomen. Well, <laughs> well, it's not in use. So these bats fly around and come in and hover just similar to a hummingbird and have these capacities to go in and, uh, and uh, hover right in front of the flower, stick their tongue all the way down to the nectar and, and go on. And obviously they get pollen on their, on their uh, fur and so on yeah. and go on and then pollinate others. In fact, pollination is a very, very important uh, feature of, of bat life in the, in the jungles. Another example of convergent evolution. Right? right, right. Convergent evolution being that different species that develop different ways to do the same thing and sometimes are very similar, like a hummingbird and a, and a, and a bat in this case, a nectar pollinating bat, that uh, uh, both have developed the same method of getting food, but that also, uh, but not, not by doing not by evolving at the same time in the same way. Right? Each have done their own path. So uh, what's in a bat's wing is an important thing to look at. Um, these again, the more I looked at this, the more I found out, you kind of just think it's just this little membrane stretched across and so on, but they are so adept, bats are so adept in their flight that they necessitate, their capacities necessitate the fact that these membranes are not just membranes, but there's many muscular things on them as well, too. There's tiny little muscular systems in there that allow them uh, to minutely alter their, their wing structure in, in mid-flight and adapt to exactly what they need to catch an insect or fly fast or do, do whatever they need. So I say that bat flight necessitated the increase of membrane surface area between the digits. This is like the initial evolution of bats, right? The little membranes that are there between everybody's different surfaces, and not so much in ours, but somewhat, right? These, our fingers actually go all the way down to here, and there's membrane things in, in between there. But they increase the membrane surface area between the digits of the forelimbs, so the fingers, between the forelimbs and the hind limbs, so there's membrane from their arms down to their hind limbs, and between the hind limbs too, which is sometimes also kept in place by the remnants of a tail. Some bats have, have much of a tail and some bats don't. But beyond that, bats also had to evolve a thinner cortical bone, which is a structure that makes you rib cage and so on. They have a rib cage, but that's a very, very light structure in them. But it also has to have tension and capacity to move and, and adjust as they're doing all these uh, amazing flight structures thing. And, and uh, so it released, uh, it eased torsional strength, but still was strong. These things are very flexible and light. And it's one reason why there's not a lot of bat fossils. There's not a lot of bone there. It's, it's a lot of uh, lightweight stuff that doesn't last long. Okay. But um, there's an amazing, powerful downward, uh, down, downstroke movements that bats do that uh, necessitate the development of the whole structure. Their whole body is made to fly, obviously. They have amazing pecs. Yes, yes. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Bats had to reroute the innervation, the way their wing muscles uh, attach to their body to give them more strength and capacity. The, the big thing about flight 
is it takes so much energy. And like we've talked about before, energy takes oxygen. Oxygen is the great combustor. And oxygen creates energy as it combusts. It either does it in a fire where you see a flame build up if you blow on a fire or pump it with a bellows. Um, or in the body, it combusts as well too and provides energy and strength and power. But there's a lot, we'll talk about the, the, the loss of, of what, what, what's the trade-offs that occur because of that as well too. So they had to reroute the whole wing muscle innervation to allow for control of powered flight to do all these different things. And that's not just the way the main muscles attach to their body, but it's also musculature developed in those, in those membranes themselves that are very, very responsive to whatever, you know, whatever the bat needs to do to fly. Well, they're like flight control surfaces in an airplane, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the strength and mass of the forelimb muscular also had to be increased to allow powerful upstrokes and downstrokes. And all this is in one bat is only weighing the weight of two dimes, right? It's just, it's just phenomenal what, what evolution calls on yeah. you know, creatures to do. When your building blocks are, you know, a few microns in size, you can put them together in innovative ways. Right, right. So, and then the last couple of things, capillaries for blood flow, there's heavy oxygen use, like I said, they have to get oxygen into those muscles, musculature to do the work, and, and the immense amount uh, of, uh, of oxygen use. I think at resting, a, a bat's heartbeat is something like 40 beats per minute, but when it's flying, it can be going at a thousand beats a minute. So pretty amazing kind of demands upon oxygen use and distribution through the body to keep it all able to do what it needs to do. Highly variable metabolism. And to do that, they have to eat a lot to keep that power structure going. And if they're gonna eat a lot, then they're flying and catching a lot. And that's one of the benefits, maybe of bats, if they catch a lot of a lot of uh, insects, right? But also a musculature, like I said earlier, of a very intricate nature is in, this, in these wings to fine tune the, their flight patterns. So uh, just amazing things to see. They put bats in, uh, um, what do they call them, the wind tunnels, right? Wind tunnels. Mm -hmm. And putting a bat in a wind tunnel, some bats don't do well in a wind tunnel. They, they just, like, they don't go for it, you know? It doesn't really work for them. But other bats uh, fly well in wind tunnel. They can really study. And then they put uh, reflective dots all over the bats that do well in the wind tunnels. And they can actually see in slow motion uh, telegraphy or telemetry. Telemetry, yeah. How it's flying and what it does and how it adapts. They can change the wind a little bit in the tunnel and see how the bat compensates and so on, too. So there's a lot of studies going on now about how they fly and what they do. And, what it, what it takes, but it's a very, very energy demanding uh, structure, which we'll see uh, more of as we talk about it more. They, their flight is so precise and so uh, capable, but it's a very, very demanding oxygen. How, how does that compare to birds? Did you see any comparisons like the metabolism of birds or the musculature of birds compared to bats? Well, like I said, bats are much more adaptable in their flight. Birds are basically strokers, you know, you can almost think of like a crew, a shell and a crew boat going in. Everybody's just pulling the oar or something like that, you know, and it's just bats are flying or soaring or, or doing things in a very symmetric way. Whereas, uh, I'm sorry, birds are doing that. Whereas bats are very asymmetrical. They can, they can pivot, they can stop, they can turn, they can rela re you know, relax, relate change to whatever's going on that they see that, that's, that's, that they want to react to. Like jet fighters. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, so. so here's a picture of a bat wing, and um, I hope you can see it well on your computer at home. Uh, there's some amazing structures in there. First of all, there's a lot of capillaries in there, tends to show that. You can see this is a modern bat wing, first of all, because it's a picture, and also that there's only one claw in that, really in that area. And uh, Right in the middle there, right? Right, up in the front there, at the top. 
And so this is the underside of a bat wing, and you can kind of see its body in the bottom left of our drawing there. And these very lightweight bones, but very strong, very torsionable. All those have to bend and flex and do things for its flight. And as it's going on, you can see there's actually musculature throughout all different parts of that wing there that all have their capacities to allow this bat to adapt its flight and, and change. Um, birds have the capacity maybe to adjust their, their, their flight feathers slightly and to do things like that, but this is so much to such a level more complex, more capable of, of uh, ad adaptation. You can see the little part of the membrane in front of the wing there, right towards the bat's body, so that has some capacity for steering and capabilities. And, uh, it's, a, it's an immensely uh, powerful, amazing structure for, for such a small creature. But there's yeah, capillaries, blood flowing through all that to keep the muscles that are in there all powered with the energy they need to, to survive and, and do what they need to do. So pretty, pretty complex system that all allows this to happen. So once again, mammals are better than dinosaurs because the birds are dinosaurs, the mammals are more, you know, highly evolved. I, I kind of like eating fried dinosaur though at times like that. I'm not sure I'd really enjoy eating fried bat. You know? Well, it's a good thing too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> there are people that eat bats and we'll get into that as well too. So we've, we've talked about a, a bit of this before, but I wanted to get into the diet of, of uh, these creatures. Uh, very versatile. They, they find ways to eat just about anything which again has its in sheep. Insects, they can eat somewhere around 120% of their body weight in insects every night. And they need that to get the energy to do what they have to do to chase them all. But when you think of a, of a whole, the Carlsbad Caverns full of, of, uh, of bats, you know, coming out at night and each of them eating their own body weight in insects, it's a very beneficial uh, capacity, very beneficial for farmers and for humans that uh, that bats eat so many insects. Hopefully mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yeah. Caddisfly, larva, and so on. A lot of different things, but very heavily into insects. Um, next one is fruit. Again, out in Southeast Asia, a lot of those bats, and down in uh, Central America and South America, a lot of the bats are fruit eaters. They don't bother people, they don't go around eating insects, they're evolved for eating fruit. And their flight structure, their whole body is evolved for that capacity as well too. So they fill a slightly different niche. Um, nectar, like we talked about earlier, again, um, the capacities of doing that, they say that uh, in, in, the, um, in the jungle, in, in the rainforests in Central America, something like 70% of the actual pollination and uh, regeneration of the rainforest is due to pollination from bats. Wow, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Vertebrates, we talked about the certain kind of bats that eat fish. They'll also eat frogs, certain ones. They really, uh, again, they can find them. They can hear them when they, when they gather to mate and they can come in over the water and find groups of them that are gathered and pick out the tastiest frog and bring it home. So they eat vertebrates, they eat, they eat uh, frogs, they eat fish. There's certain types of bats that have long canines and they actually eat birds. And there's a group of bats that eat other bats too. Huh. So it's whatever's, whatever's in the vertebrae uh, menu there, so there's a bat that'll eat it. There seems to be one that's missing from up there. I assume you're gonna get to it eventually. And there it is. Aha! Blood. Which is the one that mainly, you know, uh, gets a lot of bats a bad name. It gets people scared of bats. It gets people very worried about it. There's only three species of, uh, of bats that drink blood. And they aren't doing it like you'd see in all the movies and things like that too. Basically, they're, 
Uh, they have some capacities to fly long distances. They'll, they'll um, land on a cattle in Mexico or something like that. There are none of them around here. You don't have to worry about a vampire bat coming to your porch tonight or anything like that. But they will, um, they'll land on the neck of a, of a horse or a cow or any kind of wild deer or wild uh, animal out in the woods and will uh, not do what you think. They'll, make, they'll just make a tiny incision and that makes a little flap and it bleeds. Their saliva has an anticoagulant, sort of similar to mosquitoes that we've talked about before. And they basically lap up the blood that's kind of oozing out of this little cup. And uh, they have little grooves in their tongue that help them lap it up better and fill up with more blood. And, uh, and they'll lap for 30 minutes or something like that and go away. And then actually, uh, the animal generally doesn't really know that it's, that it's being uh, fed about. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an eerie kind of thing, and it's given rise to all the rumors and myths about vampires and so on, and how, how uh, counts can turn into vampires and get away from people and stuff like that and flap off into the night and so on. So it uh, hasn't helped the, uh, the PR for bats yeah. at all. You, uh, you didn't talk about the rabies? Yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of uh, diseases and things that come out of this. And uh, I wanted to first make sure we were talking about benefits to the ecosystem and then talk a little bit about diseases. I have a video that explains some of the reasons why bats have so many. If you'd say, why do bats have so many viruses and diseases in them? Would you have Why do bats have, have so many viruses and diseases in them? That would be an interesting question, yeah. Right. And uh, actually, if you... Would you have? Would you hazard an answer or guess why they have it? Uh, let's see. Why would they have more, relatively more diseases? Maybe their fast metabolism. Maybe they provide a, um, a lot of uh, energy because they're energy dense creatures. I, 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 yeah, I can't think of any. And we'll see. One reason is because they fly, which tends to start getting towards what you're talking about. Their capacity for flight. Uh, it, we'll talk about what all that does too in a bit, but anyways, let's talk about the benefits that they have to make sure we, we uh, think kindly of bats as we need to as, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Consumption of vast amounts of insects, millions a night. Like I said, 120% of each bat's weight is generally taken in, in volume in, in, uh, in insects each night. But not blood? No. Whatever the blood those insects have in them, well, that, yeah. you know, get. but uh, and just the capacity to do that is just a phenomenal, phenomenal thing to catch these things. Um, seed dispersal, when the the ones that eat fruits and so on and so on get seeds inside them and they generally poop while they're flying, they sort of like you do in the airlines, I guess, or whatever, and. Uh, <laughs> And the seeds are dispersed all over. So uh, an important manner of dispersing seeds and, and uh, growing the forest and so on. Another benefit is pollination. The ones that, that are able to do this and stick their tongues down into the flowers and get the, get the different uh, um, nectar from there, also get the pollen. The plants are designed some more, some great percentage, more than 50% of the, of the flowers in the in the um, jungle, in the in the rainforest, are uh, pollinated by bats more than anything else. So the flowers, the plants, have co-evolved to provide, um, you know, morphologically their shape and, and whatnot to be more accessible to bats than anything else. Right, right, right. And then the ever popular guano used as a natural fertilizer. There were islands uh, of places and, and uh, I know in the Civil War uh, people went into the into Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and, and collected just wagon loads of guano and it was generally used as a natural fertilizer, very powerful, heavy in nitrogen and all mm -hmm. these carcasses of all these 
all these insects that they've eaten, but uh, very good as a natural fertilizer. But during the Civil War, they were actually using it to make gunpowder. So, too, that's not a benefit to the ecosystem. Echolocation, I wanted to get into. That's a pretty amazing thing. Like I said, it wasn't even really understood, it wasn't known until somewhere around 1937, Griffin and Pierce uh, did it. They, the people before this had, had taken, they put uh, masks over bats' eyes. Sometimes they did gruesome things like piercing the eyes with a needle and things like that before science got more ethical. And, uh, uh, and then they'd see that the bats had no problem flying through uh, dark areas and could still go around. And they did, they put wax in their ears, they did all sorts of different things, and nothing was able to stop them from uh, flying around. So it got to be, it, it was somewhat seen as maybe a devil's thing or something. How can these things do what they can do before people knew that science demands that you look deeper into answers for things? Well, it's interesting that, a, that an interesting, magical seeming capability was immediately associated with evil instead of benevolence, okay. you know. Oh, it's magic, therefore it's bad. Well, first it wasn't magic, and second it wasn't bad, right? Yeah, I, I guess there's certain magics, like taking a cracker mm -hmm. and making it into a human body or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's magical. And they can do that? that? People say. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the magic that you define, but the easiest way to define something that you can't understand is to attribute malevolence to it, right? To say this is something mm -hmm. really bad. And, act, and you would have thought that they'd have figured it out sooner, but uh, actually after the uh, Titanic sunk, they were trying to wonder what they could do. How can bats get around things and not run into stuff? But giant ships that are supposedly unsinkable now will run right into icebergs, right? So they were trying to find again what could be done in that re-energized actually the sinking of the titanic re-energized certain scientists to start looking at how bats do it and what oh. the answer could be and it was a popular thing too the the popular newspapers of the time were putting out stories about how bats can do it and how humans have to be able to do it and so on too so uh this sixth or seventh sense this un, un, unknown sense of what bats could do was very became very important to try to discover so, actually, Griffin and Pierce did things. They realized that even wax doesn't really stop the sounds. They actually stuffed up the mouth a bit of bats, and that, that caused problems hmm. because they couldn't make the echolocation squeaks, ultrasonic squeaks. And as things got better in, in terms of electronics and so on, they could start perceiving ultrasonic sounds right, that they couldn't do few hundred years ago. So Griffin and Pierce did this and they basically uh, came up with this, it's an uncanny ability to fly and find prey in the dark. Right? That's two different capacities that they use echolocation for. One is just to fly and not and to avoid other things and the other is to find the prey that they want to eat in the dark as well. Griffin and Pierce first explained it in 1937, bats recreate an acoustic vision of the world, is what they said, when they emit ultrasonic clicks. So they make these ultrasonic clicks that go out there, they hit and rebound off, and the echo comes back. And just like sonar, like we've been able to do now, humans, we've been able, in human capacity, has done it in, in electronics, uh, these electronic clicks are returned back and then uh, the bat has to have the capacity, which is to, to me the phenomenal part, the clicks rebound off objects in the bat's vicinity and then the bat's brain is able to process this data and respond accurately to this vision. It's, it's as vision as much as our eyesight gives us. It's a vision that they have in their brain that they see and, the, and it's not true that bats are blind. Most bats have decent eyesight. So does, have you uh, learned anything about whether that co-ops or reuses some of the same circuitry in the brain that uh, mammals typically 
allocate to uh, visual processing? No, that's a good question. I, I hadn't looked into that, and it could be a pretty interesting thing. I'm not sure you know, how they, I, I guess they put sensors in parts of the brain and they see what's activated mm -hmm. when certain things happen. You know, and uh, as a bat is flying around, and to still be able to sense where their brain is doing things, it would be a pretty complicated thing. Yeah, see if the visual cortex is activated by their echolocation. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure somebody's done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, just an amazing, to me, the amazing capacity is the ability to uh, go out and back and out and back, get this, get this uh, data and data and data and regenerate the data. You're a data guy. I mean, just the capacity to, to use that data in a, in a meaningful way that can allow it to process this and to know how to immediately change its wing structure to turn to continue to go after yeah. the same moth. You know, you see these pictures and you see that as they get closer to the let's say a moth that they're chasing that clicks are faster and faster that they're emitting and the response is back and then it comes to be like a, a moment when they're right on the thing it's called a buzz and that's when they that's when they've captured them. But but how do you immediately take that capacity from a brain, you know, from the reco coming back and change it into muscle, yeah, yeah muscle movement to, to fly and to divert your, your path? That makes me think of another dumb question. Have insects evolved the ability to hear this uh, ultrasound and try to evade it, do you think? There is, there is actually one moth that's able to put out a, 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 a different buzz that comes back that actually jams the oh, sonar. That's of, great. Of bats. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that one's evolving too, right? Yeah. But part of the answer is, like it's shown here, the call is going out in orange here from the bat flying around, and then there's a pretty nondescript box there that it doesn't want to run into. And the box is putting back an echo that comes off of that, and some of it doesn't ever travel to the bat, and some of it does and the bat starts processing all this information. And if you can kind of see on the bottom right there, they show the call and the echo is a t function of time. But there's two lines that come in there. There's a dark green line and a, and a lighter green line. And those are the right ear and left ear of the bat. So the bat then is not only taking the data that comes back, but it's taking the two pieces of data, the right ear data and the left ear data, and using that to hone in on exactly where this home box in. is. Home in. Home in. Right. Home in. Good, thank you. Yeah, serve and correct. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what Dave's shirt says. Dave's shirt says the grammar police to correct and to serve. All right, then they do a little ad. I didn't lead into that properly. I wanted to uh, kind of lead up to that, but that was basically talking about uh, uh, diseases and communicability, and uh, I thought it was very well expressed. It's pretty interesting. It also seemed to bring up a lot of the same topics uh, that we've talked about earlier, about viruses attacking cell structures and how it happens and how bats have evolved means of dealing with it. When we were talking about CRISPR, we were talking about how bacteria have learned how to deal with viral infections mm -hmm. and what to do about it too. So, so uh, you know, it's a constant evolution and a constant fight for uh, survival, obviously. It's and like it's, a whole web like, of science. It's like a web of existence almost, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he talked about a cytokine storm, which I just wanted to clarify a bit. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it. Basically, uh, sometimes the body's reaction to a pathogen is so intense and so abrupt, it sees this terrible threat. It sends in so many white blood cells and T cells and everything, it throws the, it throws the kitchen sink at it, basically. When it sees a, an infection, and a viral infection is a pretty challenging thing, that sometimes the viral infection cannot be the real cause of death. Uh, during the Spanish flu, uh, epidemic in 1918, 
people were reacting, their bodies were reacting so much. It was strong, young, healthier people were tending to get it, and they had a very uh, advanced, uh, very strong um, uh, system to, to combat it that they sent in so much powerful T cells and white blood cells, all the different things uh, to, to combat it. And the inflammation was caused by all these uh, structures growing, all the development of, of all these white blood cells, that it basically, uh, the lungs would be filled up with fluid and, and uh, the remnants of all the things that the body created to fight the virus. And people were dying from not being able to breathe. Their lungs were filled with the fluids that they created to try to fight the virus. So a cytokine storm is this overreaction by the body to, uh, to a, a challenge that then causes more problems for the body. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things in, in that video, but basically talking, and I hope he talked a little bit fast, but I think that he covered it, it helped me a few times to hear it again. And if you go to YouTube, and if you uh, type in on YouTube, why do bats carry so many diseases? This will come up and you can see it again at your leisure and kind of stop it and think it through and go on again. But there's a lot of uh, amazing points that he's bringing up here that uh, to me are, are uh, very uh, illuminatory as to why bats can have all these, can be natural reservoirs for all these diseases, yet still not be impacted by them for the most case. Rabies seems to be one that they still are susceptible to, um, but not in very great numbers. But, um, but very well worth watching again if you can take the time to do that. Um, Paul Selnow asked a question that came in over, over the line, and he's talking about if there's bats that are flying so close to each other, there's so many bats flying and they're sending out these signals and all, more signals are coming back in, but bat A and bat B and bat C and all, all these different bats are all sending out signals. To his mind, it would seem like it would be an incomprehensible storm of data coming back, uh, which is a logical supposition to make. Actually, there are, there are some studies on that as well too, and I know that somehow they detected that mother bats coming home to a rookery uh, go into their roost and they can find their young in a rookery of a thousand young bats that are hanging around waiting for them. They can so find to speak, their, hanging around. Yeah. <laughs> they can find their, their child in a matter of seconds. So there's some level of discriminatory capability that's obviously there in terms of being able to hear the sound that their young make and and respond back to it, or, or the young hears the sound that they make. And also there must be a capacity to discriminate, otherwise they would uh, they would crash into each other. Well, just like we can tell different voices of different people apart. Well, maybe not just like, but yeah. perhaps analogously at least. Right, right. But still, it, it's a complicating factor. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Great All question. this data, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting question. This data comes in like that, that has to be, uh, just more of a problem to the whole structure that, uh, of, of echolocation. It, it seems like one of those things that's a great idea, but how could you actually make it happen? And, mm -hmm. and uh, ima yeah, imagine thousand uh, torpedoes coming in at a, at a, or a thousand icebergs coming in at the Titanic. Yeah. How do you react to all that data coming in? A thousand torpedoes during World War II, how do you react? And how does, how a thousand how torpedoes to a thousand ships. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and each one, which one is the one going at you, and which right. one is the one that's going to miss you, and, you know, would you turn properly to turn to the eight, or would you turn right into the three others that were going to miss you? Hmm. <laughs> All right, I had a few discussion and question issues to think about, and uh, I know we're going a little bit over time, uh, but that's because it's Science Sunday, and we tend to do that. <laughs> Are bats a net positive or net negative to the environment? I, I don't know if you have an input about that or thought about that. Yeah, I want to go hug a bat. I think you've convinced me that they're, they're very beneficial, especially the pollinator thing. You know, I don't know that they'll take the place of bees and we should still conserve and protect our bee populations, but it's, um, it's encouraging to, to learn that at least some pollination, some important pollination is done by 
bats as well. And only by bats, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't want to lose bees because you don't go back down to one thing and say, well, let's just have all our pollinators be bats or right. all our pollinators be different. Like you said earlier, different plants have co-evolved to be only able to be uh, pollinated by a certain species. You know, there's certain species I know that Darwin talked about it. Someone showed him a picture from Madagascar of a of a plant that had a 14 inch long uh, distance from the outside of the flower down to the pod where the nectar yeah. was. And Darwin said, "Well, that must mean that someday we'll, people will find." Uh, a pollinator. pollinator on this island that is able to have a 14 inch long tongue and yeah. one did it, it was found not too long ago either it took a long time but that has to happen it wouldn't need straws right yeah right uh, Dave says we have about six minutes left on our battery for our cameras so. okay battery yeah I'll do better next time second question what are the ramifications if we don't address global environmental destruction of wild spaces What's going on now is that burning of the of the uh, forests in the, in the rainforests and so on to make more land for cattle or for gold mining or different things like that. All these things are are have a short term benefit to uh, human humans supposedly that you get more McDonald's hamburgers able to be made or you get more gold able to be dug out or whatever. But uh, what it's also doing that people aren't seeing is that it's bringing us into, it's bringing humans more into contact with more wild creatures, more uh, creatures that have had their own space and are now being encroached upon by humanity. And their diseases. And their diseases. Yeah. And the diseases that, not, that go both ways, the diseases we bring into that area and the diseases that are passed on. So we're seeing a lot of these pandemics and problems occurring more and more because of that type of issue too, of, of us moving into these wild spaces. If you're hearing the tablet, I'll see if there are any late breaking questions. Okay. Should we have a bat house at DUC? Sorry, Dave. <laughs> if we should have a bat house at DUC, that could be an interesting project for kids to do here. Maybe they want to see this video or see some videos and do a project with that. And maybe you want to do something too that installs a bat house at your home. I made a bat house for my daughter Allison out in uh, the hinterlands in St. Charles area, uh, King County, and uh, she lives on about seven acres of land in a rented little place, and uh, and they see bats around there. So we want to make an environment in which bats can survive and succeed around here as well too. So. Any other thoughts come in? No, that's, uh, that's it for the questions. Oh, but wait a minute. We get uh, Gary uh, Hansen. Mul multiple bats using echolocation simultaneously might be analogous to multiple people shining flashlights at the same time. Just as we're able to paint a three-dimensional map of our surroundings from the reflected light, they're able to do so with reflected sound. So maybe, I guess the implication, if I'm reading this right, is that maybe bats take advantage of the fact that there are other it could be, they could use more data, yeah. possibly, or it could be uh, white noise or something like that, too. It's hard to say that somebody else maybe knows better than Dave, I. Dave may know. It's called the cocktail party phenomenon. The cocktail party phenomenon? Yep. What happens at the cocktail parties you've been going to? <laughs> <laughs> and why have you been? Never mind. <laughs> Lots of voices, but we can hear our own name. Ah, okay. Yeah. You, you discriminate, yeah. If you're at a cocktail party and there's all this noise and everything else, but if somebody mentions your name across the room, you, your ears perk up somehow. Cool. Neat point. Well, uh, thanks so much to Steve Cooper and DUUC for sponsoring and helping us uh, put this together. And uh, Steve always makes it look a lot smoother than I'm sure it is for, for me, but I uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, the humanists got their Zoom act together. Yeah, the Zoom people came in on this too, so that's nice. And uh, I know two weeks from now you're going to have a Zoom meeting. Yeah, two weeks now uh, from now I'll do another just science news discussion. Those have really been working out well this summer, and uh, so I'll do at least one more of those. If you haven't been on those, uh, 
will send out an information brochure about how to get onto the Zoom meeting. Does it say how many people were on the Zoom meeting at all there, Dave? Eleven. Eleven people? Good. And uh, I plan to talk about Alfred uh, Russell Wallace nice. in uh, a month from now, September. So uh, the co-developer of, uh, of Evolution with Darwin, or without Darwin, he, was, he did it on his own. Yeah. And uh, the Wallace line and different things that uh, he found out on his trips. He took two major trips, one to South America uh, with his brother and a, and a close friend, and uh, his brother died on that trip. <laughs> so they weren't they weren't just uh, you know taking little. It wasn't a luxury line. It wasn't a luxury trip, right? They were out there in the in the woods collecting uh, species and so on, and they actually made their living by selling specimens to uh, collectors in England and so yeah. on. And then his second trip was to the Far East and uh, Malaysia and the uh, Indonesian Peninsula and so on, and that's where he. Uh, developed malaria and then a malarial kind of uh, dream state he kind of came to the image of what how uh, how evolution was furthered evolution was pretty well understood well it was pretty well accepted by many scientists at the time but the mechanism for evolution is what he basically spent a lot of time uh, coming well, up with. tell us more on I, in September yeah, yeah. So, thanks a lot appreciate it very much thank you again Steve and have a great holiday stay safe out there all right, have a great rest of August and stay safe out there. And uh, Yeah, we've got several people you. saying thank you on the Zoom meeting. Remember to wear your masks, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Go Cubs, go.